how did these fishes get introduced out to these states in the watershed? Uh, most of the data we have here um, shows that species were released. Now, uh, like I said before, there are 608 species that, that we have records of. These numbers add up to far more than 608 species. And again, this is because the fishes can be introduced by multiple different pathways. Uh, in this case, uh, when we say released, this is generally an illegal or a non-sanctioned, non-authorized uh, method of introduction. Uh, stocked, in this case, would be a legal or uh, state-sanctioned uh, uh, introduction or state sanction release. Um, we do have unknown on here as well. You know, there's some species where it's, there's potential for multiple pathways or we're unsure of um, how a fish might be get out into the wild. Um, now, if we look at this uh, kind of uh, in a spatial sense, you can see some regional patterns uh, come out. So for example, uh, the canal species, uh, the species introduced by canal tend to be in areas where there is large amounts of canal development. So again, in the Great Lakes region, New York, South Florida, and in California. Uh, escaped captivity, uh, you, that's primarily found in the Mississippi River Basin where there are lots of, uh, and in the Atlantic Southwest where there's lots of aquaculture programs. Um, released, you know, you tend to see those all the way across the country with uh, South Florida being a hotbed of, of aquarium releases. Uh, and then stocked uh, tends to be in these mountain streams, both along in Appalachia and in the, uh, the western portion of the United States. If we look at that over time period, we do see some changes in a particular pathway over time. So in the early portion, again, before 1950 or so, uh, we see stocking as the primary method for uh, species being introduced as well. Uh, but coming into approximately after 1950 or so, we see a, a large num increase in number of species um, that we're getting in through the release pathway. So again, this could be uh, through uh, aquarium dumping uh, or uh, release bait or a couple other different uh, minor releases. And then that trend continues to, to go uh, up through the present where uh, released organs have become much more important in the modern time. If we look kind of into released fishes, again, we break that down just a little bit. Again, you can kind of see that pattern where uh, the aquarium, there's very few that were um, illegally released kind of early on, we have data for, um, but as you know, the rise in uh, fishing as a sport and aquarium keeping as a hobby, we see the number of species uh, within those two pathways rise dramatically. We can look within stocked fishes. Again, stocked, uh, Sport fish enhancement is a primary pathway throughout all time periods uh, with, um, with a, some increase of stocking for forage as well. So most of these stockings are primarily around for fisheries enhancement as well. So what is driving some of these changes in patterns? Again, we see uh, the rise in the popularity of the aquarium hobby uh, as, uh, as a public interest. Uh, with the uh, drive for uh, a more diverse uh, set of fauna uh, within the trade, we see a higher potential for release. Um, you know, you also see uh, a changing in the popularity of recreational fishing. You know, as uh, more anglers uh, enter the sport, you have a higher potential for uh, release of bait as well as uh, demand for desired target species, which might increase the amount of uh, stocking of a particular target species. Again, uh, sometimes you might see the uh, changes in our target species, both regionally and through time. And as these uh, target species change, that might uh, cause a change in management priorities. So either a species might enter a stocking program as uh, angler preferences increase for that species. And then uh, if it wanes, then the stocking of that species would wane as well. Um, the US is you know, the single largest importer of ornamental fish in the, in the world. Uh, and that helps drive the, uh, the diversity in the aquarium trade and, as, and in the aquaculture trade. So if we look at this graph, um, this is not cumulative. This kind of shows um, over each year, the number of distinct species with records of introduction. Uh, and this shows that just kind of over all pathways and then are released and stocking uh, individually. Because um, these two different pathways tend to drive most of the uh, introductions we see across the US. Um, what we see, you know, as we go through time is a general increase in the amount of species that we see uh, year over year as well. Uh, up to a peak you know, of 
you know, early, you know, right around the, the turn of the century. Um, and then we start seeing a reduction as we get closer to the day. Um, so what might be uh, driving some of this change? Um, you know, as an academic discipline, invasion biology really came in in the 1950s. And so there was a much more interest in uh, looking at invasive species as a whole. Uh, we do see some changes in management practices. You know, instead of widespread uh, stocking of a diverse array of species, uh, many management agencies went through a more targeted approach uh, and with a little more concern about the biology and the ecology of uh, stocked waters. Uh, we also see uh, changes in um, some legislation. Uh, for example, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Non-Indigenous Aquatic and Species Prevention and Control Act, and the National Invasive Species Act, uh, and the Lacey Act uh, all came around to had and it had impacts on the number and types of species that uh, could be introduced. For example, Lacey Act started to prohibit species that could be uh, imported and uh, moved around the country as well. There's also was a rise in the public awareness uh, of uh, the impacts of invasive species uh, with some high profile species such as Asian carp, uh, kind of as a more uh, modern example. And as well, uh, the education public outreach such as the Habitatitude campaign to try to uh, educate the public on the uh, impacts of releasing species out into the wild. So uh, in summary, uh, you know, introduced fishes are widespread both in their taxonomic breadth and their geographic distribution across the U.S. Uh, the pathway is that fishes can be introduced very both temporally uh, and spatially in importance. Some pathways are more important in different regions. Uh, again, our release bait is more uh, prevalent in the East Coast where there's a high degree of native bait species. Uh, stocking of species out in the uh, western United States uh, that had a much more reduced diversity of fish fauna uh, compared to the East Coast. We do see an increase in the different types of intentional releases over time, such as aquarium releases or fish stocking, uh, with more illegal releases in recent time, as well as the overall decline in the number of species across pathways uh, in recent times, which might suggest a uh, Potential relation to legislative changes, species management programs, and public awareness of uh, non-native species impacts. Uh, and with that, um, that's all I have. Super. Thank you so much, Matt. That was really informative. And You're we welcome. unfortunately don't have any question. Uh, we don't have any time for questions right now, but we will have time at the end. So we're going to hop over to the next presenter, um, Joe Maroney, and I'll let Justin do the introduction. Are you still there, Justin? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, please introduce Joe Maroney, who represents the Kalispell tribe of Indians, who will be preventing, presenting a case study on invasive northern pike in the Columbia River Basin. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, Justin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be talking about northern pike within the Columbia River Basin and uh, kind of talking about the case study and the, the, the issues that we're dealing with. So <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that Matthew had given a presentation on the USGS, their non-indigenous uh, database, because I use that pretty extensively. So right here, what it does, the number of introduced species within Washington, Idaho, um, Oregon, and Montana. And as you can see from the around 1900 up until the present, you see this ever increasing in the number of introduced species within each one of those states. <clears throat> um, kind of alluding to and can, you know, expanding on what Matthew had presented is the green shows the number of introduced fish um, within there. So within Washington, we have 66. Um, and granted, this is only, uh, this is last year from January. If I would have had time to actually update this, it probably maybe would have increased by one. So you can see in Idaho, there are 73 fish that are introduced, 77 in Oregon, and 57 in Montana. So a large proportion of what's introduced within those states is fish. Um, so northern pike, and why are they so bad? 
Um, first of all, they're an apex predator. They are highly invasive and can cause large scale changes within fisheries communities. Um, when they are introduced, they can significantly reduce prey densities or even eliminate entire species. Um, and they're also highly fecund. Some females can produce up to a quarter million eggs. Um, and they can live very long and they can grow up to 45 pounds. So the fish that you see that's on the right, that was a fish that we had caught in 2008, um, 37 and a half pounds, and it was 44 inches in length. So, you know, large, large fish. So <clears throat> using on one of the maps from the USGS again, the, the color that's kind of in that, that tannish color, that is the native distribution of Northern Pike. Um, primarily, they're on the other side of the Continental Divide. There is also a segment up in Montana, which is on um, the eastern side of the Continental Divide, that actually drains into Saskatchewan. There's actually native northern pike that are up there. All of the other colors that you end up seeing in the variety of colors of kind of magenta and purple, that is the non-native range of northern pike. Um, so the expansion through the West has going from 1948, um, and these are just basically spot locations of where pike were first you know, found and documented. Um, and this was also taken through the USGS website, is you can see from 1948, and if you continue by decade, we start seeing an ever increase of the distribution. So in 1988, there's quite a bit that spread throughout. And particularly within eastern Montana, we start seeing a large, large expansion of northern pike. And as Matthew had alluded to, a lot of that had to do with releases that were, you know, not authorized primarily. But then you also start seeing it kind of encounter within the Idaho and also into Washington. And by 2018, you end up seeing these are just dots. It doesn't show the flowing of they were if they were introduced within a river system, the expansion of northern pike and how it's gone over the last uh, 40 years. So it's uh, been pretty horrendous. So the area that I'm going to be talking about is up in that purple circle, which is primarily uh, where I'm talking about is northern Idaho and northeastern Washington. So <clears throat> the red color that you end up seeing that goes from the slide from the right to the left, that is the distribution of Northern Pike and how they've basically kind of gone from the right side over in Montana through Northern Idaho downstream into Washington and also up into Canada as well. Um, the square box is the area that I'm gonna be talking about. And so this is the project area that we're really, really focused in on is this area within what we call the, the box canyon pool and also the boundary pool. And is, to kind of give folks on the phone a, a scale is the Ponderé is the second or third largest tributary to the Columbia. So, so it's a pretty big system. And within uh, runoff that happens in June, it's not uncommon to get flows around 100,000 CFS. Um, but lots of hydropower and particularly between these areas of Box Canyon and Albany Falls Dam. So pike showed up in around 2004 and when they first showed up, um, both the tribe and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife got together and basically came to this slogan or this problem statement is that pike are a problem that they're not an opportunity. And I think that's a really um, important thing to highlight because you can imagine an area that has been starved for a fishery for 40 years because the hydropower, the fishery was in significant decline and then you have fish that are showing up and some of them are getting around 30 to 35 pounds. Um, trying to get to that um, outreach and education to the public that pike are a problem, not, not an opportunity, was a hurdle that we had to, you know, implement and kind of go over. So what we did is we established some management goals and what we wanted to do is minimize the impact to native species. We wanted to reduce the spread of pike to other waters, including the Columbia River. We were extremely fearful that people were gonna be stocking Northern Pike 
um, in adjacent water bodies that weren't connected to the Columbia. And that actually happened a couple different times. Um, and we also wanted to reduce the numbers of pike that were in Box Canyon Reservoir. So the timeline is they showed up in 2004. Um, in prior to 1995, up until 2004, there was no documentation of pike within the reservoir. Um, we did hear some anecdotal evidence that there was a pike or two that was caught, but we never caught one in any of our um, surveys that we were doing. So what it did is it kind of gave us the opportunity to get in on a ground zero of initiating the Northern Pike study. So what we did is in 2005, we started looking at um, doing some surveys, looking at some studies. Five years later in 2010, we started doing what's called our spin survey, which is a spring pike index netting. We started doing that in the reservoir. And then we started in 2011, we started doing a pilot program doing some suppression. And then that was when we initiated our public outreach and regulation changes. And the reason is, is because we saw just this almost exponential growth of Northern Pike from in 2004, 2005, it went up to greater than 10,000 fish in a span of six years. So we were highly, highly concerned. So in 2012, we initiated a full suppression effort within Box Canyon Reservoir, and we've been doing that every year since. Um, the reservoir that is immediately downstream, Boundary Reservoir, in 2017, we started doing it a full suppression within there, um, and we, we continue to, to do that. <clears throat> so here's kind of the timeline when we were working on our suppression efforts, is if you look onto the left, that gives, um, so we started in 2012, and and I got data points up until 2018. But you can see, it gives you the scale of the number of efforts that we were setting out. So we were setting out variable mesh size of gill nets, um, setting them out overnight, going out the next day and capturing the fish. And so in 2012, we went out and set, you know, roughly 1,000. 2013, we set out 1,200. And then you start seeing a dramatic, a, what I would call a dramatic decline in the level of effort that we had to do in 2016, 17, and 18. Um, we've set over 5,000 gill nets, which is roughly about 140 miles of continuous net. Um, and what we saw is we saw a decline in effort, but it was also we saw a decline in the overall abundance of northern pike throughout that time. And this is what I call the, the, the slide that really kind of tells the story. So in 2012, we were measuring not just the number of pike that we were removing, but we were also measuring our mean catch per unit effort, the CPUE. And that was our gauge that we were using when we were implementing our spin to kind of compare if we were going to be successful or not. So when it hit in 2012 and roughly we got about 6,000 pike, we went out the next year and we got more in 2013 but we also had a higher level of effort but we saw a slight decrease in cpue when we hit 2014 we got about 4,000 pike and our, we saw a slight decrease in the cpue that was a moment that us we kind of had a uh a, a moment of can we be successful in doing this or not um there was a lot of folks within the Columbia Basin that had said there is no way that you can suppress within that large of a system uh, a 55 mile long reservoir that's roughly half mile wide. There's no way that you can suppress population down to the target levels that you really want to. Um, and when we hit 2014, I was thinking that maybe those folks were right as well. Until we got to 2015 and we saw a significant drop in the number of fish. Um, and also a significant drop in the catch per unit effort. And that number has bottomed out to where in 2017, we got a total of 32 pike. And in 2018, we got about 270. Um, so, you know, it was, you know, we were successful in that effort where we can suppress it down below a number that we were actually looking for. So that was really exciting. But, and also what it told us is, 
we needed at least three years of doing intense suppression in order to kind of crash that population because not all of the age classes were recruiting to the gear for what we were setting out for our variable mesh size. So <clears throat> to date, up until 2018, we removed you know 17,500 northern pike from just Box Canyon Reservoir alone, um, and it's 42,000 pounds of pike that were removed because they were you know, extremely large fish. So we removed that many from Box Canyon Reservoir, 17,500. We reduced the relative abundance of northern pike by 98% in an 89 kilometer long reservoir, so 55 mile. Um, and what we did is we demonstrated the feasibility and the effectiveness of doing this program in not just a, a, a large system, but also a, a complex river system. Um, kind of switching gears just a little bit, is uh, both Justin and I sit on the Washington Invasive Species Council and several years ago we went through a prioritization process um, what we call the top 50 priority species both terrestrial insects aquatics um, and northern pike is on the council's top 50 list which what that does is it kind of highlights the importance of dealing with this type of species um, in addition to that, in 2018, we took part in a Western Governors Association um, Western Wide Risk Assessment. And what we did is we did a survey. And so what we see here is it's the top 10 established aquatic species that were in each one of the states. And if you look at the bottom, it's ranging everything from Alaska to Arizona to Colorado, Hawaii, so, you know, a large number of states participated in the survey, and it was for the species that were present within the state. And Northern Pike floated to the top as number seven. Pike are an issue within other states, such as Utah, California, Colorado, Alaska. Alaska's dealing with Northern Pike on a huge scale. Um, even though northern pike are native to about three quarters of Alaska, where they are not native on the Kenai Peninsula, they have um, implemented almost an all-out war on northern pike within the uh, Kenai Peninsula, and they are getting success on that. Um, the Kalispell tribe coordinates with those folks pretty regularly and share information and you know try to figure out what is the best plan of attack. And when we first started doing this work, we contacted the folks up in Alaska to find out, you know, what are you guys doing up there and, and how are you being successful? Um, one of the <clears throat> aspects that we think that needs to continue on this is this increased awareness of Northern Pike, um, particularly where they're not native and throughout the Pacific Northwest. And that has really, come to fruition over the last two to three years where we have, you know, Christine Dunker and Parker Bradley came down for a conference from Alaska to talk about Northern Pike. They were our keynote speaker. Um, working through the Pacific Northwest Pike Forum and Coordination Meeting, um, Upper Columbia Interagency Pike Forum, PENWAR, which is the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, has been highly engaged in um, the raising the awareness and also the pike problem has been described through the Northwest Power and Conservation Council as you know demonstrating what is going on and what the impact of what these invasive fish can do um, and the council the the Washington Invasive Species Council and the Northwest Power and Conservation Council I got too many councils in there um, work together to come up with this web tool um, and so the on the bottom right is the link to it, and this is just of a, of a screenshot, but this has been in the works for probably about um, at least seven to eight months. But it's a very, very interactive tool where you can look at, you know, the what's highlighted below is, you know, the problem, management stories, monitoring data, how you can get involved. So it's a very interactive tool that if folks on the phone are interested um, after this, they can click on that particular link and find out a lot more of what's going on. Um, 
So when you pull that screenshot up, here's some of the management stories that are out there. It talks about the Columbia River Basin as a whole, um, <clears throat> the work that we've done in the Pend Oreille, what's happening downstream within Lake Roosevelt, and also the Lake Davis. They did an economic study on the impact of Northern Pike um, and if they escaped into the Sacramento and Northern California, what would happen to there? Um, so it's you know going to be a huge, huge economic hit to not just the state of Washington, but the Pacific Northwest in the anadromous or salmon and steelhead zone if northern pike end up um, expanding further downstream. And we are getting ever increasingly closer on this map showing the distance that is separating northern pike and from salmon and steelhead. And probably today it's not actually 57 miles, but I think it's actually probably about 51 miles. So <clears throat> where it says Northern Pike, um, just right up above that, what's in red is Lake Pondere. So you got the Clark Fork, Lake Pondere. It flows north along the Pondere River, meets up in Canada, and comes down in the um, what's called Lake Roosevelt. You also have a population of Northern Pike that is immediately below where it says Northern Pike in the Lake Coeur d'Alene area. And those fish have been slowly moving down throughout the system. And so what fisheries managers, not just the state of Washington, but the state of Oregon, British Columbia, tribes, lots of folks are really, really concerned about is having those fish move further, further downstream into the Columbia Basin. So, um, we're also really concerned because Northern Pike have been caught in Lake Washington, um, which is on the West Coast um, over by Seattle, and they could have impacts on juvenile salmon. Um, so anyway, there's my acknowledgements. Um, lots and lots of work has gone into this, um, particularly we get funding through Bonneville Power Administration, BIA, lots of different funding, you know, crews, um, and then also a uh, kudos goes out to my crew that has to deal with this every spring when we go out right at ice off um, to go set gill nets to go get northern pike um, and try to suppress them in you know to numbers where we're not really impacting anything else so with that um, if there's any time for questions i'll take questions perfect thank you so much joe that was a great presentation um, we do have time for one question, and I do have one posted. Um, Victoria asks, since gill nets are non-species specific, when gill nets were set to catch invasive pike, was there significant uh, bycatch? And if so, was the bycatch of native species considered? That's a great question. That's, that's usually, um, that's the first question I get. So we set the gill nets out right when the ice comes off so the water temperatures are really really low we set the gill nets and so they're set overnight non-target species um, are released and what we get is we get about a 98 percent survival of the fish that we release um, initially when we were setting gill nets we were setting them in um, not just March, but April, but also into May. One of the things that we ended up seeing is later on in the year when we were setting gill nets, um, when the water temperatures were increasing, we were seeing um, a decrease in the amount of survival that we were getting in non-target species. So since then, we no longer do gill netting unless it's for a spring pike index netting. We don't do any suppression efforts um, after basically April. And so, and then to answer the second question, part of that, the majority of the the non-target species that we're getting are non-native, primarily yellow perch, tench, pumpkin seed. Um, occasionally, we would get um, a native salmonid, um, but those were really pretty low. We're setting the the gill nets into areas where, when we did our radio telemetry, we knew where the pike were staging for when they were um, spawning. Super, thank you so much, Joe. Um, hope there will be time again at the end after the next presentation for additional questions. So I wanna invite the audience to type questions as we go. 
Um, even if you're thinking of a question uh, for a previous presentation, go ahead and type it in that question box and we'll try to get to them at the end. And with that, we're going to switch over to our next uh, co-presenter. Uh, let's see, we're going to switch over to Janine Bryan. And uh, Justin, I'll let you do the introduction. Great. Well, um, thank you for that, Joe. And we saw with Ma Matthew's presentation that this is a pretty significant problem across the United States. But what Joe demonstrated is that we can do this. And by bringing or organizations together for common purposes, we can stop the spread of invasive species. And um, I'm really happy that Janine was able to join us to highlight some new technologies that might be able to help managers uh, do an even better job. So um, with that, please introduce Janine Bryan with Woosh Innovation, uh, Vice President of Biological and Environmental Sciences. Take it away, Janine. Thank you. So, um, I'm Janine Bryan, I'm the excuse me, of invasive species in the U.S., and many of them are native to just specific locations throughout the country. Uh, an example might be American Shad on the East Coast is, is native, but on the, on the West Coast, um, there are invasive species in the Columbia River. Some invasive species cause damage that can harm the habitat. Some can be apex predators, like we just heard about. Um, so sheer numbers or their ferocity is a, is a major concern in different aspects of, of controlling and monitoring invasive species. Uh, we are a, an innovative uh, engineering company that is really interested in fish and in fish management and, and is focused on fish passage. Um, and yeah, our initial um, <laughs> there we go. Our initial developments of what we've done is, is try to to be able to help fish um, in a more safe way move across barriers that have been made. Um, you know, everybody I think knows about uh, fish ladders and, and salmon and their ability to get up them, and there's they do it fairly well. But there are many many other species that need to be able to. Uh, surmount many barriers and in in the case of invasive species especially in the midwest but in other locations as well we've actually put in barriers into rivers to prevent the spread of the invasive species but in doing that we've actually inhibited the river connectivity of the native species and so we've looked at our technology not just as a fish passage system but also you know what can we do with respect to uh, addressing invasive species what you see in our picture here is just one an example of one of our um, systems. And um, I'll go into it in several other slides, but the technology basically allows fish to move through a tube um, with, with differential air pressure. You can see the sort of the, the silhouette of this fish moving through here um, very, very quickly and very safely, and rather than having to swim up a ladder or that kind of a thing. But prior to being able to go through a tube um, up in the top screen, we actually have the fish come in, they go through um, a way of, of scanning and looking at the fish, and then we can actually selectively sort them. So what, you know, what we want to emphasize today with respect to new technologies is, you know, are there ways of doing selective sorting with respect to invasive species? Basically, you know, leading into that question that um, Joe was answering, just on, on the northern pike, when you use, you use nets and you're, you're going to have bycatch and you're going to have to sort through fish. In this system, you know, it ultimately will be an autonomous fish will swim in and then it'll actually selectively sort them and we'll move them out if they're invasive species. And so we'll talk about this here. Uh, again, this is another picture of, of what the instrument looks like. The technology, the big all this area on the, on the left side of the, the schematic or the picture, that's where our scanning system is which is actually taking many, many pictures of the fish very rapidly uh, as it just slides through, but we don't actually handle the fish at all. And then just after that, you can see that there's sorting gates so we can provide the information from the imaging to the sorting gates. In this case, you know, a fish that might be coming straight at you in the picture would go into a tank and then could just be removed from the river system rather than being uh, put right back into it. So this is a, a schematic of what that's really all about. And, and we talk about it as selective autonomous volitional and economic or fish passage, but it also allows invasive species removal. 
So in, the, in what we're describing, um, and what we what um, Kevin Irons will be describing is is a way of looking at this, where there's an entry, and in this case, a steep pass. And the fish actually swim up into uh, the system, and then they come over a false weir. So I'm going kind of left to right across the picture here. They're dewatered mostly. There's just a little bit of water left, and then they're on an incline, and they just slide, and they slide through um, what we call our facial recognition system, sort of like facial, but it's fish. And in that um, half a second that they're sliding through, we end up taking 18 images and immediately process them through very rapid um, computational algorithms to be able to identify the fish and then. Um, trigger a sorting gate that would say the fish would either be something we want to pass, something we want to remove to the river, or uh, return to the river, sorry, or um, we would put it to a place where we could then um, remove it from as if it was an invasive species, either put it into a bin and take it out, or remove it through one of our tubes to a more uh, feasible place to then remove the fish. So just to describe how this, the scanning system works, as the fish comes through, this is just nine of the actually 18 images that we get. Um, but we have six cameras that are going off and, and take three individual pictures each one as the fish is sliding through. We have um, technology such that we can then um, measure the fish and decide how big it is, its orientation. And as we gain more and more of the images, we can then actually have algorithms that will identify the fish species. And at this point, I think we've had about 23 different fish species that we have um, collected images on. We have over 300,000 images of fish that have gone through that we've been using to make algorithms so that we can identify the fish effectively in real time as they pass through without having to actually manage or, or handle them. This is just a top view of our whole system. And we have systems that are land-based, and this is one that's water-based. We brought this up to Chief Joe, which is the, the northernmost or the furthest most um, dam on the Columbia River to do a study this past summer to show that we could have fish enter the system volitionally through a steep pass and pass through, identify the fish, and either then move them through the tubes up to the height of, of Chief Joe Dam and, and then back to the river. Or actually, if they weren't what we thought was appropriate, we would send them straight back to the river. And so we had a proof of concept this summer that really showed this technology in its full capacity uh, works remarkably nicely. But we can actually take them and it's been designed so there's just components so we can just use the scanning or just use the scanning and sorting in different applications to be able to, uh, again, monitor fish and, and, and sort the way we would like. And if we would like to be able to remove invasive species, then identifying them and sorting them is possible. Uh, next slide. Okay. So, um, I think you can go ahead. Just to um, to have you all think about something a little bit different as well. Uh, the Columbia River here in Washington State is is a huge, huge river, and it's something that we all um, identify with with respect to salmon. But it's something that I think is sort of overwhelming. The sad to think that actually that's really not the case in this day and age. Uh, what you're seeing here is just the, 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 the counts of fish that went over Bonneville Dam, which is the very first dam on the Columbia River, just off of the, after you come from the Pacific Ocean, and the number of salmonas that were there um, since, the, since the Bonneville Dam was created in 1938. And um, so just these are decade increments of, of the average totals. And you can see in, in blue, this is salmonids, and there was an introduction of American shad, which are an East Coast fish, so an invasive species to the West Coast, that started coming up the Columbia River and actually started liking the Columbia River, probably in part because of the dams and the fact that we had slower moving water and warmer water. And as time progressed, um, the shad really enjoyed being in the Columbia River, so much so that by the 1980s, they became the dominant species outnumbering all of the different salmonids in the Columbia River combined, and it has maintained that status. You know, there's fluctuations and variations, and, and the numbers overall have changed over the years. We've done better in the last um, 10 uh, decade or so, but um, this is a, you know, a really a benign fish, nothing like the apex predator that we were just hearing about from Joe, but 
in sheer mass numbers of fish that can destroy habitat, they are making a huge impact on an incredibly important riverway and, and impacting huge numbers of very valuable fish, the salmonids and many, many others that are in the Columbia River. So we really need to think about the scope of what in, invasive species can do. They don't always just eat other fish, but they can destroy the ability of the other fish to survive. Um, we have installed one of our scanning systems uh, this past year at Bonneville Dam to scan to see what fish that were coming through and to get those images that I was talking about so that we could be able to recognize and then sort out. And when the American shad come through, which is the fish that is in the um, bottom right corner with our logo is there, that's an American shad coming through the Bonneville Dam. It really is very recognizable and very different from the Chinook, the um, steelhead and the sockeye salmon that are also migrating at the same time. Our system in, in terms of the technology um, has the ability to do the selective sorting, but really on, on fish that are motivated or migrating. Unlike uh, the northern pike, which are not so much motivated to do that, it was much more difficult to sort out in this way. Uh, but as fish that are migrating over dams and barriers, it makes it very easy for us to um, selectively move out invasive species. Normally in a, in a fish window, like at, at Bonneville Dam, this is what you're seeing the fish swimming through. And, it, and folks are counting the fish and easily recognizing that American shad are there, but they're in water and they're just swimming and there's nothing we can do about actually moving them or, or selectively moving them or taking them or stopping them because they're all just in water swimming. Whereas when they're in our system, we're identifying them and can immediately put them down a different track and sort them out. So these are just some images of a few of the fish that we, um, invasive species that we have seen in the Columbia River. You see them, Northern Pike, that's actually from, not from Bonneville Dam, but up, upstream um, at Lake, Lake Roosevelt. But some of these other um, bass and American shad and Northern Pike minnow are, are all very prevalent here. But we've also started working in different parts of the country um, and our, what, what um, Kevin Irons is going to talk to you about next is, is the, um, the concerns of the Midwest, primarily the Asian carp. And these are some of the images. And there are some common carp here, some silver, big head, grass carp here. And also, it's a question of um, can you turn it? Um, the sea lamprey. And we have another study that we've been doing with uh, USGS in the Midwest on sea lamprey. We're collecting these images so that we can, again, use our technology to start sorting these, things, these fish out of the river system as they swim in. So in order to do that, they have to swim and we have to see if we can entice them to do that. And so this is a um, this is this common uh, Alaskan steep path that we often use for salmon. It's a question that we are going to try to ask this summer is can we entice um, Asian carp to swim up this or something to deflect this such that then they would enter our system and we can do this selective sorting autonomously. And um, with that, I'm going to let um, Kevin Irons go ahead and continue to tell you about what we hope to do this summer to look at the Asian carp problem in the Midwest. All right, thank you, Jane, for the introduction. Are we having a feedback issue right now? Yeah, Janine, if you could mute your line, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Asian carp. Um, these are the Chinese carp, four species we've already been introduced. Uh, but also, you can think about northern pike and the methods to reduce their population. Uh, you can almost insert the strategies, the harvest removal to gain um, back our watersheds uh, for our native species. Uh, we like to call that leaving nothing to chance. Uh, we're trying to prevent them with technology such as barriers, uh, innovative fishing methods, not only from the North America, but also borrowing from Chinese, what we call unified fishing methods, where they fish a whole lake out, but bringing all these things to bear. And what Janine talked about is this new technology that uh, Maybe it'll help us do even better than what we
Oh, Kevin, I think you muted yourself. Could you check that your uh, your audio is on? Okay. I don't know how I did that. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Uh, we are we are talking about Asian carp. These large-bodied, high-profile uh, cyprinids. They do look a, a bit strange, or at least different from the native fish, which makes this technology one that might work here in the Midwest. Generally, we don't think about fish passage in the Mississippi River system um, or here in Illinois, um, but these guys actually are, are planktivorous fish. So uh, where we have large abundances of fish, if there are some places we're gonna identify that these fish may be motivated to get into and then maybe able to climb the steep pass uh, and, and we have to understand that to be able to make this technology work. Okay, though, um, I show you the big head silver is a grass carp. Some of our Asian carp, this is a black carp. This one's over 115 pounds. So these aren't no small um, uh, fish. Obviously, it's pretty easy to detect these large fish and get them out of the systems. But the ones that are the same size as, as native suckers, uh, native sport fishes are the really ones that this technology will focus on. And we all probably know about the Asian carp because of their uh, ability to jump. So they're strong fish. Um, they do jump out of the water. So that does suggest to us also that uh, they may be motivated or able to, to uh, go through some of these uh, fish passage structures. Now Asian carp, I, are uh, not unique just to the Mississippi River system. And we'll be talking um, ab about the Illinois River in the middle of this photograph, but really grass carp have been uh, transported across the, the whole continent. And um, we see various uh, big head and silver carp, this is from USGS, have been introduced uh, in many states outside of the Mississippi River Basin. So this is something we all should be uh, concerned uh, about. And while common carp is a, um, non-native species that we're all should be aware of. Um, when we say carp in this context, we're not talking about what I call grandpa's carp. Common carp is off, off, um, often confused as being one of these Asian carp species. And uh, many people off, often approach me and say, oh yeah, my grandfather used to catch Asian carp and he used to cook it in such and such a way. And so there, there is a teaching moment that, you know, these fish are relatively new, only in the last uh, 30 to 50 years in the US, US, grass carp being brought in in the 1960s, uh, big head and silver carp in the 1970s. So I won't bore you with a lot of details. We do have a, a very active management and response plan to keep these fish out of the next basin, uh, the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, we have detection projects, management and control projects, and response projects. What if we don't, what if we're surprised about our management or, or detecting them in a new, new place? We do have the ability to respond in those new areas, remove them in a quickly coordinated fashion. Um, and this is all done through a multi-agency uh, work through the Asian Carp um, Regional Coordinating Committee, uh, federal and state agencies around all the Great Lakes. Of course, Illinois is doing a lot of, lot of the uh, heavy lifting, but uh, our partners always have our backs and, and come and, and helps us out. So in that vein, uh, we have this connection between the Illinois River, which goes from uh, upper right to lower left, and a, a man-made connection, a canal that was made back about 1900 um, near Chicago, and that connected the Great Lakes Basin uh, to the Mississippi River Basin. And we have seen many species come from the Great Lakes Basin into the Mississippi, um, white perch, uh, round goby, um, dozens of, um, about a dozen species in all. We haven't seen fish motivated to go into the Great Lakes. However, water quality has improved in those canals. And we have this, um, pardon the, the phrase, a horde of Asian carp coming, and uh, they are moving um, up up our river systems. We haven't seen that movement um, past this leading edge. Uh, if you see Brandon Road, um, they've been at that approximate location for about 30 years. Um, but over the last 10, we've uh, focused on harvest and removal in both the Dresden Island Pool, which is between Dresden Island Pool and Brandon Road Pool on this map as well as increasing um, harvest of these populations farther downstream. 
that uh, 10 years worth of uh, removal has shown a, a significant decline at that leading edge below Brandon Road Lock and Dam, about 97% uh, since 2012. And over that time, it's about 10 million pounds of, of Asian carp have been removed from the upper part of the Illinois uh, waterway, not just in Dresden Island Pool, but also the two downstream uh, reaches. Just a lot of heavy lifting. And unfortunately, we work from February through December. Uh, really no time off to, to get this removal done. So in all, on the Illinois River, and here you see about the 300 miles, again, from upper right to lower left, um, flowing into the Mississippi River, uh, we have three areas of focus. One is, is in the blue circle up by Chicago. Make sure there's no fish there. And then red is our management zone where we're removing fish using technologies like the Chinese Unified Methods, contracting with commercial fishers to work with our biologists to, to fish thousands of yards of net annually to remove 10 million pounds since uh, 2010. And then farther downriver, the green circle is really for um, commercial harvest. This is where commercial fishing has been active over hundreds, 100 years. They can remove uh, three and a half million pounds a year, uh, and we're hoping to increase that in, in, in the future, all to keep them from spreading and reducing the population where they exist. Now here's where technology comes in. We're doing a great job of removing fish, but there are some areas that are either dangerous or hard to fish. Uh, below dams is one of those things. And um, we've identified two here on the map, one in the upper river, one in the lower river, where what if we were able to put one of these steep pass machines in, get an Asian carp up it, then automatically sort them. And we did find a partner with the Nature Conservancy on that lower star. It's down in, um, in the Lagrange pool, the lower Illinois River, but it does start putting some of these uh, things together where we can test what Janine was talking about. Can we get them into one of these fish ladders, these steep paths? And if we can get them to, to climb that, then we can sort them, remove them automatically, and then frankly, let the native fish right back into the river um, we're not worried about passing them necessarily, um, but putting them back in the river, removing the bad fish. So the Nature Conservancy, and I apologize for all the green on the photo, but they're at that red circle. They, they own a backwater lake, largely carp free, which means it has vi uh, very vibrant zooplankton and phytoplankton communities. And annually or eight, each few years, they have a control structure, they release water. And uh, it's been known that the Asian carp will get up in that water at the release because of the, the high quality food resources for them. So at this location, this picture here shows an overhead view of that control structure. Um, part of their management plan is to, re to dewater this lake or wetland uh, occasionally uh, in a natural fashion, allow uh, moist soil vegetation to grow up uh, seasonally or every few years. Um, they don't want Asian carp in their lake, so they do have the ability to put stop log structures and screening uh, in to make that happen. But we think this is a great partnership where we can actually test something where the fish would love to be up there. I call it a golden corral buffet, where all this fresh zooplankton food is coming out, essentially carp free. Everybody's fighting to get in front of that line. And that would be the motivation of fish to climb up the steep pass. So the bottom line, uh, we know harvest is removing fish from the system. It's working. We've seen great uh, response in the upper river. But some areas below dams or other discharges uh, really uh, are difficult to fish. Uh, they may be dangerous to fish or not even legal to fish. So how do we put places in those hidey hoes where fish may be remaining and yet our fishermen can't, can't get their hands on them? And then this technology may further our abilities to remove uh, Asian carp and also freeing up labor uh, to move from other areas. Um, and our perfect storm, if, if the sorting happens, we can throw the Asian carp into a live net, come by every few days or a week, load them up, remove them from the system, um, whether it's 10,000 pounds or 200,000 um, pounds, our fishermen can doing, be doing other work in areas that they can uh, most accurately and efficiently fish. So we're really excited to run this um, uh, study this summer, uh, put this in place, see if fish will climb the ladder. If they climb the ladder, uh, they're a very unique fish. 
we have high confidence, then we can sort them. But really, our first uh, step this summer is is working with the Nature Conservancy and Woosh, put this in the water, get fish um, uh, up the ladder, and, and test if we can get them there. Then uh, we can start putting these solutions in place at places uh, very similar where fresh plankton is coming. And that's not just in Illinois. It could be in Kentucky um, or up other uh, Mississippi River states. So I ran through that very quickly. I am also available for questions, and uh, I'm sure Janine is standing by as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was uh, those were really great uh, presentations and information. And we do have a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with the one I, I believe is directed at um, at this uh, most recent presentation from Kevin from Helen. She asks, "Can the scan recognize all ages or stages?" Well, that would be a challenge. Now, uh, the important thing is, I guess we're not trying to pass them necessarily. I, I think the Nature Conservancy may have a future need to, to pass some of the other native fish, maybe paddlefish or buffalo. Um, but that's the next step of this project, right? Um, we believe uh, identifying the adults will be fairly straightforward and easy. Um, the small ones are still pretty unique looking, but that's, you know, an inch or two fish. Um, they start looking like other fish, like shad um, and other minnows that are, that are out in the river. So um, we will have uh, some work to do with that. But Janine, I know, and, and the folks from Woosh are, are pretty confident we can at least get to juvenile and adults, and, and then we'll have to start looking at those other things. Not sure. Bell, we he, can't hear it. Yeah, I think Bell, you might be muted. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're right. I'm so sorry. Uh, Janine, did you have a follow up to that? Uh, well, just I. Kevin is right. Um, and again, so I didn't go into you know, huge detail on the technology, but with respect to the scanning, um, you know, the more images that we have, we take those images and then we apply it to machine learning um, and um, you know, do deep learning and, and algorithm creation from those. Uh, uh, so you know, things that we recognize with respect to the fish and how we are identifying are you know some of the things that the computers will actually use, but but much of it is 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 things that they the computer can recognize that we don't in a very unique way. The thing about the Asian carp, um, you know, as you as you look at them, you know, for myself, as soon as you start seeing that eye that's much lower than the mouth, it's really pretty easy as to what it is. But um, but the, the the computer system can can recognize so many other features absolutely at the same time. Um, it's just with the very nice high definition images that we have, it makes it very easy for it to, to identify many, many features at the same time. So as, as the, fit, the more fish we see in a different life stage, the more we can develop those algorithms to be able to recognize the fish in, in all of its stages. And that is one of the things that we are continuously doing is collecting more and more images from different locations at different times of the year, at different opportunities so that we can get a better recognition database. Super. Um, one more question for this last presentation, and then we'll open up questions to all of the panelists. Uh, Victoria asks, if the ladder ends up not working, are there any other attractants that could be used or are being considered, for example, reflective materials or certain light wavelengths? I'd like to take this uh, Good night. Just, one, just, just to explain why we are even using the ladder. So um, in order for our system to work as we designed it initially for fish passage, um, as the fish go through the through the scanner and then the sorting system, they're just again they're just sliding, and so we need to get them high enough to be able to slide them down to be able to sort the things. So we only need them to really come up about four feet. The ladder is is a good first start, but there's lots of different other options. Um, some of them it, it may be um, something linked to like the Archimedes screw or some other different ways of or there's just a lift. 
Um, there's, there's many options that could be made, but this would be a simpler way because actually because the Asian carp have a tendency to want to jump and, and can and are strong swimmers, it will actually potentially selectively drive them through as opposed to some of the, the native species that won't want to or we don't necessarily even have to encounter them. And Kevin, I think, has more to comment. Sure, I, I um, we do a lot of work with the uh, deterrents as well as attractants um, in, in the carp fight. Um, in, in sea lamprey, they use a sex pheromone to draw those fish in. Actually, for carp, food has been shown one of the, the largest attractants. So we think this is a way from the carp-free water, they'll have the, the desire to go up there. Um, there are some other enzymatic um, and chemical um, signatures that, that could be used. Uh, USGS is a partner on this for advising. They're kind of, you know, seeing their role in this now. Um, you know, if, if we only are getting 25% passage, you know, there may be things we can do with, with flow um, and other chemicals to, to fully engage their, um, their ability to, to climb the steep pass. So yet to be seen, but yeah, we'll have other options uh, once we understand their ability to, to attack this thing. Super. All right. Um, let's move on to questions for all of the panelists. I'm going to put up our title slide here. One second. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So let's see. We did have a question. I think that was directed to Joe. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yes. Uh, Ellen asks, did you look at the stomach contents of the pike that were removed and what species were they targeting? Uh, Joe, I think you might be uh, muted. Oh, there we go. Oh, Joe, now you're unmuted. Ah, okay, there we go. Um, yes, we did. Stomach samples. We also took otolos to determine age. Um, one of the things that we found out, and we saw that also in the fisheries community, is if you have soft fin rays and if you're shiny, you go first. Um, so we saw a significant decrease initially in our mountain whitefish, salmonids, pea mouth, suckers that were native, and then we started seeing a decrease in everything else. Um, we also saw everything from ducks um, to eventually, once they started depleting the prey base, we started seeing northern pike within their own stomachs. Um, so they were becoming cannibalistic. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Okay. I think so. All right. Any other questions for the panelists? Uh, you can type it right in that question box in your control panel. Um, and while people are thinking of questions, um, Justin, did you have any follow-up questions you'd like to ask? Sure. I'll, I'll ask uh, Matt Nielsen a question. Matt, the USGS Nutrient Program is a really great tool to help people understand the distribution of species and what threats might be coming from other watersheds. What tools does your database have that people should be aware of to help understand species that may be headed their direction uh, to a new state or to a new watershed? Sure, so we have uh, a couple of different tools. Uh, the first tool that we have is what we call our alert system. Uh, this is an opt-in system where uh, an interested party could receive uh, alerts when uh, new records are entered into the database for a new species at, uh, uh, in one of four different hierarchical levels, either new to the country, new to the state, new to the uh, county, or new to the Huck 8 watershed. So that'd be like the small little local watershed. Uh, and you could sign up for this at a whole taxonomic group level. So you could sign up for all fishes. You could sign up for just things uh, that are coming within your state, or if you're interested for a couple of particular uh, species. Uh, we also have um, a new tool which was developed a few years ago uh, called the Alert Risk Mapper, which kind of goes into this and along with these alerts is where we try to develop a short-term uh, model for risk of expansion from a new uh, new introduction. So that takes into account uh, species biology, whether it, it can undergo passive or active dispersal. Does it swim upstream or if it will only flow downstream? 
uh, what are some of the other kind of do over land uh, uh, transport uh, uh, does it uh, live in headwaters uh, or main stem of rivers um, you know how far does it swim how big is it things like that uh, as well as barriers uh, we also have uh, what we call the flood and storm tracker which looks at uh, the potential for spread due to storm associated flooding primarily this is done uh, for major storm events like hurricanes but we are starting to branch into trying to do um, major uh, inland uh, storms and flooding as well great uh, good good question Justin did you have any other uh, another follow-up question I don't see any others from our audience right now um, sure yeah uh, Joe Joe Maroney the the presentation you made really illustrated the threat that Northern Pike uh, posed to salmon and steelhead of the Columbia River what's the plan for organized response once they're detected you said they're 51 miles away yeah um, am I unmuted can everybody hear me yes Okay, um, so as of today, Justin, there really is no clear cut plan. Um, I know the information and outreach that's gone within the state of Washington is if you see a pike, you know, kill it, report it, contact the Washington Invasive Species Council. <clears throat> but as far as a, a early detection rapid response plan, that is not um, currently in play right now. Uh, I know that there was some a budget request through the Washington State Legislature for doing such a thing, um, but it's not in play right now. And so it's basically getting the co-managers, local people, PUDs interested in this. And I know that there's, you know, continually every month, it seems like more interest is generated on this that, you know, if you see a pike, you know, contact one of the four or five people that you know to develop um, a game plan for going out and attacking it, but as of today, something solidified that's funded, there is not. Got it. All right, any other questions from our audience? Um, I don't see any new ones. Justin, uh, one more question and then I think we'll wrap up. Sure, great. Yeah, both to Janine and Kevin, seems like new technologies like autonomous sorting, acoustic deterrence, and electrified barriers are being really well used, um, directed to an Asian car. But from your perspective, are we placing enough emphasis on research and investigation into new technologies? I'll go first. Well, I think that I think we can always do more. Most definitely. I think um, you know initially it was to control and to um, you know prevent any any spread. But um, you know the more we can do with uh, developing new technologies to actually remove is is something that um, I think we could use a lot more support in um, both in in just in you know, financial support that 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 it's these are huge problems as you can see um, these guys are dealing with them on every day basis you know um, eleven months of the year um, in terms of the invasive uh, the Asian carp um, so it's a huge impact on their their um, personnel and on their on their um, budgets but it, but you know if we could use also um, more support in being able to to look at new technologies because there's also you know, we're constantly as a new technology company dealing with the fact that we're working in waterways where there's uh, endangered species as well and we have severe um, limitations of our ability to try new technologies in, in waterways where there are endangered species even though those aren't the target species for what we're trying to address it, it inhibits us from actually working in many locations and that's kind of a big problem and so there has to be a balance between being able to advance technology that can actually benefit many, many things versus, um, you know, inhibiting ourselves by saying that, you know, well, we don't want to go there because what if something else, the what ifs really um, hamper 
innovation and new technologies. And it's not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't consider them because we should, but we have to be able to, to look at change. I mean, the fish are doing things differently. They're invading. So they are changing the environment. We have to be able to, to change ourselves as well in the way we think about doing fisheries management. So this, this Kevin, I will add that uh, there is quite a bit of research being done on Asian carp specifically from uh, attractants, attractants and deterrents, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service have all been working together with Illinois and our Great Lakes partners. Um, a lot of our work is funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the U.S. EPA. Um, I, I don't know where we would be without that type of funding. Um, we would not be where we're at today. Uh, this last summer, uh, USGS has deployed CO2 um, in an environment here in Wisconsin, um, uh, because I'm traveling through the state right now, um, and, and it was effective and uh, to deter some fish. So there are new technologies out there. And the important part to remember is, is you know, we're talking really large river systems and some river systems that aren't invaded yet, that these technologies have to be used. Um, it's pretty broad. And um, what we may or may not use in Illinois, maybe very more uh, uh, honed for another state to use. Um, or if we talk into rapid response, we do have a plan. What happens if a, a fish gets here, we can roll out a plan and help guide our decision making. But uh, in a rapid response, maybe those tools are, are better uh, to go in and, and be utilized, whether it's a, something that will kill the fish or attract or deter or catch. A lot of times the research has, has been done to make our gears better. Um, I guess the last thing I would say, our USGS partners work with Kentucky over the last uh, few weeks to have a big catching uh, event in, in Kentucky Barkley Lake using technology, using the, the Chinese, um way of fishing to see if that is a tool that they can use so thankfully we do have research going on and of course uh, we also have the actual work of removing harvesting and reducing the threat of where they're actually at thanks for the question excellent um thank you kevin and with that we're gonna wrap up as we are we are at the hour and a half mark um, i want to thank our panelists again for taking the time to be here and present uh, this really interesting and comprehensive webinar on challenges and new technology for managing invasive fish. Um, let's see, I want to also thank uh, the coordinators of NESA, National Invasive Species Awareness Week, and again, the Washington Invasive Species Council for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, without their support, uh, we would not have been able to do this. And please uh, tune in to additional webinars this week. We have a webinar each day of this National Invasive Species Awareness Week. We are also recording and posting these webinars on NASMA's YouTube channel. So check into that, follow NASMA, and uh, you can share the recording with your colleagues. So with that, thank you again, Justin, and all of our presenters today, um, and have a great rest of the week.